As a 16-year-old living in Aotearoa in 1881, you could head down to the pub after school. There's no law against it. The drinking age and on licences back then was 16. The purchase age and off licences was zero. There was no age limit. If your dad was a bit tired after work and had an especially precocious three-year-old, he could technically send them down to the liquor store for a gallon of mead or whatever they drank back then. A few years later, in 1910, things changed. The drinking age was raised to 21 for on licences. Off licences followed in 1914. And then in 1969, both were lowered to 20. Then in 1990, 18-year-olds were allowed to drink in bars. Nearly a decade later, in 1999, the off-licence age also dropped to 18, where it's remained ever since. Now, the point of that somewhat tedious introduction is to demonstrate that age limits on rights and privileges are dynamic. They change over time. And they're also inherently arbitrary. There are plenty of 50-year-olds who are terribly harmful drinkers. There are probably a few 17-year-olds who are very moderate. But as a society, we've elected to pencil in a line, an age of broad assumed competence. And we do this for lots of stuff, right? Like booze and cigarettes and gambling and criminal responsibility. We do it for adoption. We do it for standing for public office. And of course, we do it for voting. But every now and then, the winds of change pick up. And picking up, they are. The Supreme Court has declared the minimum voting age of 18 years old as inconsistent with the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act and has not been justified. I'm Emile Donovan, and today on The Detail, what the Supreme Court actually said in its recent ruling on the voting age, whether the age is actually likely to drop to 16, and the philosophical and ethical considerations we make when considering whether to expand access to certain rights and privileges. John Ipp is an Associate Professor of Law at the University of Auckland. I began by asking him to describe the question the Supreme Court was trying to answer. The court was being asked whether the legislation that governs voting in general and local elections that specifies you have to be at least 18 years old, whether that was consistent with the guarantee in Section 19 of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, which basically says don't discriminate uh, on a variety of grounds, one of which is age. Now, there's a lot of nerdy law stuff going on here, so I will try to summarise in brief. Why is the voting age 18? Well, there's actually no real reason, and we'll get to that later in the pod. And there are a bunch of ages at which various rights and responsibilities of adulthood kick in. But 18 is kind of considered a de facto age of majority. Your parents no longer have legal responsibilities for you, and you become a full-fledged adult. Now, the thing is, the Bill of Rights Act in New Zealand has a section saying that people can't be discriminated against on a range of factors, among them, age. This section, relating to age discrimination, it kicks in at 16, which is, again, arbitrary, but it explains why you don't also have a group called Make It 12. There is broad social acceptance that if you're under 16, you actually can be discriminated against because you're a child, a proper child. And so really, the question was, why is the dividing line for voting at 18? Mm -hmm. Why not 16 or 17? Now, you might be wondering to yourself... Well, you also have to be 18 to drink. Why isn't there a make it 16 for drinking? And the explanation for that is that the Crown can discriminate on the basis of age if it can justify that decision. There's a good reason for it. And this case was essentially make it 16, asking the Supreme Court to tell the Crown to justify the age discrimination on voting. And this is a really interesting um, point that I that I'm not sure I I've sort of fully understood myself, but it seems that here for whatever reason 
the Attorney General just didn't really argue this point. Mm. This is what the court says at this point. It says the Attorney General has to show why 18 was chosen as opposed to 16 or 17, given that the prohibition on discrimination expressly defines the scope of the protection by reference to age 16, as we mentioned earlier. Mm. And then it's and then the court says the Attorney General is candid that he has not sought to do that. <laughs> We just like saying, you know what, I'm just not going to play. This led the Supreme Court to issue what's called a Declaration of Inconsistency, which basically says, hey, there is a clash here. Someone's got to come and sort it out. What has to happen is the Attorney General has to uh, notify uh, Parliament of, uh, of the fact that uh, there's been a Declaration of Inconsistency. And what's meant to happen is within a period of six months, the responsible minister is supposed to bring forward a report that says what the government's going to do, basically, in response to the declaration. That's supposed to happen within six months. Afternoon, a big win for the Make It 16 campaign today. The Supreme Court has sided with the group and agrees that not allowing 16 and 17-year-olds to vote is, in fact, age discrimination. All eyes will now be on Parliament. This afternoon, the Prime Minister has said that Cabinet has decided to draft legislation on lowering the age. And with me now is Make It 16 coordinator, Caden Tipler. Hi, Caden. So here is where we need to draw the distinction between the provision in the Electoral Act governing general elections... Um, and uh, the Local Electoral Act provisions. Um, So the provision in the Electoral Act specifying 18 as the minimum age for voting in general elections, that provision is uh, what we call entrenched. And what that means is that it cannot be amended by way of a simple majority. Right. So entrenched provisions can't be amended by simple majority, but instead have to be changed either by a parliamentary supermajority of 75% or by a majority in a referendum. Okay. So, for example, as was done in respect of uh, MMP, based on the reports that I've seen, it it seems that it's the parliamentary route that's being contemplated at the moment. Uh, Assuming that's right, changing the voting age in respect of general elections is going to need bipartisan support, right? Because you need to you need to hit 75%. Mm-hmm. Um, and it seems questionable whether that will be um, forthcoming. Mm. However, the local electoral act provisions, that is not entrenched. Um, and so that can be changed in the ordinary way via a simple majority. So, you know, one possibility is the government, assuming that, you know, that this is the government's view, we don't know, it's too early to say, but let's assume it's the government's view mm-hmm. and the government decides that it it wants to spend the political capital and it's going to uh, try and, and, and get this um, over the line. It would likely have the votes to get the change in respect of local elections over the line. What you might find is that you could have 16 and 17 year olds voting in local elections. You know, it would be nice to have someone voting in local elections. <laughs> Um, but however, because of the supermajority requirement to make to affect the equivalent change in respect of general elections, they, that might not be um, that might not be possible. Richard Shaw is the director of Massey University's College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Richard, we have decided as a society that a seven-year-old cannot be licensed to drive. Can you please explain in brief why? I would imagine that that is because a seven-year-old may struggle physically, mechanically, cognitively to drive. Underneath all of this would be a question around competence um, and how it is and when it is we decide somebody is competent to do the thing in question. And I I would imagine that most people would agree that your average seven-year-old would not be competent to drive We have also decided, Richard, as a society, that 13-year-olds cannot buy a bottle of tequila. Can you please explain, again, in brief, why? Probably not a question of competence, because I imagine a 13-year-old would be able to walk into a shop and physically purchase the tequila. That, I think, um, at this point, we veer into questions around ethics and morals and what we... It's the zone of the normative... uh, 
the conversation at this point becomes one about what we feel is appropriate behavior and what might be considered safe behavior as well. So question to, to considerations of competence, we would need to add those much fuzzier questions around morals, ethics, what seems to be appropriate behaviour. And, and Richard, finally, in this triumvirate of hypotheticals that I've sort of given you, we've also decided as a society that a 15-year-old cannot become the mayor of Palmerston North. Can you please explain why? Well, once upon a time, um, until 1969, we decided that a 20-year-old couldn't become mayor of Palmerston North. Now they could become mayor of Palmerston North. Mm. And shortly after that, we decided that a 17-year-old couldn't become a mayor of Palmerston North, but an 18-year-old could. So that's a different kind of conversation again. Now you're, now you're heading into, with the third leg of that trifecta, you're heading into a question about how we govern ourselves, how in a democratic society we agree to the institutional arrangements which make the rules according to which we agree to be governed. And those have changed quite significantly across the, the kind of the long span of what we would consider democracy. The normative position around what 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 is competent, what who is who is competent and who is not competent, and what is required in order to to meet the threshold of competence, that's bounced around quite a lot. And so I think what is going on at the moment, particularly coming out of the recent Supreme Court decision, is another one of those little historical moments that are dotted around mm. the history, not only of this country, Australia, New Zealand, but other democratic societies, around the question of who's competent to have what kind of say in determining the rules by which we agreed to live together. It, it's, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because all of those three examples are forms of discrimination based on age, yet discrimination that we as a society agreed can be justified. So there is an inherent tension there, isn't it? But it's not that controversial. Uh, I think the last of those is becoming controversial. Mm. Um, let me just step, step back a little bit. There is a There is an argument that goes something like this. The the history of the development of contemporary democracies amounts to the removal of one layer of exclusion after another. Mm. So we come back to our own democratic history once upon a time. In order to have the franchise, you had to have access to or own capital or wealth in your own right, individually rather than communally. And if you had enough of that stuff, sometimes you got to vote more than once. So we had plural voting through until the latter part of the 1900s. For quite a reasonable chunk of our early democratic history in the, in the post-1856 era, we uh, excluded Māori and we excluded women and we excluded people under the age of 21, apart from in 1919 and in 1941, where there were legislative changes that allowed military people who were serving actively in the military who were under the age of 21 to vote. Those were, those were temporary aberrations. We come forward to 1969. There's cross-party support in the House from both the, the, the government and the opposition. The law has changed to reduce the voting age from 21 to 20, and that happened a year after the United Kingdom had done exactly the same thing, but that reduced it to 18. Mm -hmm. 74, we drop it again. Uh, so in, within five years, we, we have reduced the age at which we have collectively agreed that it's appropriate for somebody to be able to contribute to the, the process of decision-making out of which our laws come by three years. And then we leave it for 50 years. So I think that this is just a circle back to your original question. I think this um, has the, the, this most recent upspurt or, or surge in, in, in activity around the question of when we should vote or when we should be able to vote, where that limit lies. I think that could become quite controversial, particularly in the context of the times where the opportunity costs of policies, where the benefits and the burdens of, of trying to live well together are falling disproportionately on people. So the 2022s, the, the, this is a different time to the 1969s and the 1974s. So I, I just wonder if this might become a bigger issue than perhaps we give it credence at the moment. What are the sorts of social factors that we look at when we think about changing ages I think there are considerations of power and control 
um, controlling who has access to particular resources or who has access to particular areas of collective life, who gets to control who makes the decisions. You know, I think back to, or I'm just reflecting on some of the views which have been expressed in public over the last several days. And in fact, well before that, this, the debate around oh, how old you should be in this country in order to vote. There are quite fundamental questions about power and control um, and decision-making rights and where those are vested. I, I, I can see, for instance, that in the current political climate, there might be some older people who are concerned about providing younger people with greater access to the political process. I mean, they could they can engage in politics in all kinds of ways, which don't necessarily default to voting. But you, it doesn't take all that much effort in the current climate, I think, to think about a series of policy domains in which young people's interests are perhaps not as well served as those of older generations. And, and perhaps there is something in there which might partly explain why certain people, not all people, but some members of older generations might be slightly reluctant about giving control away to people who then might change the rules of the game or take the game off in a different direction. When you consider the voting age, and the question of whether that voting age should be lowered, what are the most persuasive philosophical arguments on on both sides for and against lowering the voting age from your position? I think the the most cogent argument against is that at the age of 18, we've reached the point at which we may be able to make well-informed decisions. We are we are agents. We we understand the circumstances in which we live to a greater or lesser extent. And so there is some fundamental ability to make a considered, deliberate choice that may not be quite as well developed at the age of 16 or 17. It's not one that I agree with, and not only because there are plenty of 16-year-olds and 70-year-olds who are entirely capable of meeting that particular threshold. It's one I disagree with fundamentally because there are an awful lot of older people who are perhaps not quite at that <laughs> threshold. People who are older over the age of 18, <laughs> make decisions in the ballot booths for all kinds of reasons. Mm. And some of those reasons are ones that would give many of us cause to think about the competence of the person in question. Of course, <laughs> we don't ask that for very good reasons, because the minute we do that, we get into this weird conversation where you essentially set somebody a test. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be completely <laughs> <laughs> well, inappropriate. You've got to pass a test to but, vote. Yeah, we don't want to go down that route. Do that's we? why we don't, we don't, appealing as that might be in certain occasions, uh, <laughs> you don't, you really don't want to do that because that's that's the death knell of democracy. And part of the problem, it's not a problem, I, I actually think it's part of the flawed beauty of a democratic system is that it's always a second or a third or a fourth best outcome. It, mm. it can never be the kind of pristine thing that some of us might carry around in our heads. The strongest argument for reducing the voting age, I think, is one of intergenerational equity and fairness. Somebody who is uh, who is turning 16, the minute we finish this conversation, is going to live with the consequences of decisions that people of your generation and mine and my mother's generation have been taken for a long time, uh, but they are not yet able to inject themselves into the processes out of which those decisions are made. My sense is, and here is where the context really kicks in, some of those things, the price of housing, the quality of rental accommodation, the cost of tertiary education, a planet that is either burning or drowning, depending on where you are at any given point in the day, these have uh, an existential quality which are significantly in excess of equivalent situations that I might have found myself in as a 16 or 17-year-old. The times are such that it, it, it becomes even more important for people who are going to have to live with the consequences of others' collective decision-making processes. For them to be involved in those things seems to me to be a fundamentally fair and equitable thing to do. I'm going to lay my cards on the table here, Richard, and I'll caveat this by saying I'm by no means a hardliner on this. I'm open to persuasion. Uh, I don't think anyone should be influenced at all by my opinion on this. Uh, people should not listen to me. They should not turn to me for political <laughs> opinions. But, you know, when it comes to voting, 18 feels about right to me. But if you were to ask me why my answer would probably be uh, a very long and uncomfortable silence, and then I would say, I don't know, vibes. 
and and that w- that would be it. Like you can make an argument about intelligence and engagement, but these all fall down as you've as you've just said when you consider that there is no shortage of dumb, unengaged adults. Yeah. The most persuasive argument t- to me is let kids be kids. Don't pollute their minds oh, yeah. with with politics before it's absolutely necessary. Because caring about politics sucks. Yeah. But even that is very okay. condescending in its way, right? Like, what? I mean, what do you think? Am I a sneering backwards gatekeeper pulling the ladder up underneath me now that I'm thirty one years old? Oh, a wee bit, a wee bit of all of those <laughs> things, maybe. You know, vibes. It's like Dennis Denuto standing up in front of the Australian yeah. Supreme Court in that glorious the castle and trying to argue a case and saying... In summing up, it's the Constitution, it's Mabo, it's justice, it's law, it's the vibe, and uh, no, that's it, it's the vibe. It's a thing we feel... But and I, I take your point about it being vibey. When we, when we use that term, it's the vibe, it's, it's just that we're trying to capture with with words, with, with with sharp edges and angles, things that are really hard to pin down. And I'll take your point about why you might want to let the kids be kids uh, until they absolutely have to be dragged, kicking, kicking and screaming into the political process. Part of the problem, I think, is that heaps of them don't get dragged, kicking and screaming at 18. That's, mm. That is part of the case for reducing the age to 16. We know that even though the proportion of people aged 18 to 24 who are enrolling and turning out to vote at general elections is a little bit higher now than it was two or three elections ago, it's still substantially lower than is the case for most all other age cohorts. We know that voting is habit forming. So we know that if you vote the first time that you are eligible to vote, likelihood is you continue to do that for the rest of your life. And the reverse also applies. If you don't vote that first time, chances of you ever getting back on or even getting on that horse in the first in the first place is is much lower. So we know that there is a I mean, we, there is a there is a train coming down the line. Mm. In 30 or 40 years' time, if we don't involve in greater numbers in formal arena institutional politics, then we're going to have a really badly hollowed out system. There's just one other thing about the vibe. Bill Rowling had a vibe. In 1974, when he was the Prime Minister and and the Labour government, third Labour government, was putting through the legislation which would drop the voting age from, from 20 to 18. Bill Rowling made a really interesting speech in the House. And and rather than framing the right to vote as a right to vote. He framed it as a responsibility. Mm. And he wasn't alone. Members of the National Party opposition expressed much the same sentiment, was saying, look, it's a responsibility. Young people need to be brought into the nation of which they are citizens, and they need to accept their responsibility, their civic responsibilities as citizens. I'm not suggesting we would need more vibey language, Emil. We can't (laughs) use that kind of language these days. But if we can find the right vibey language, and we do that by listening to those people, those 16 and 17-year-olds who are active in this particular issue, I think the idea of looking at this as almost another rite of passage, like turning 21, but better, you know, yeah. you there is a part of there, there is something incumbent upon you that means you you reach this point and you step into the public domain, you step into the public realm, and you accept the responsibilities you have as a citizen. And I and my 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 feeling about the question of 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 where the age limit should be is that. I look at the enrolment trends and I look at the turnout trends and then I look at the state of the world and I think I would quite like to have more of those young people accepting a civic responsibility to enter into the public domain and engage with it through the voting process and all sorts of other things. And I feel that we would all be better off for that. I I, I just don't see a downside to it. That's it for today. I'm Emile Donovan. The detail is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air and produced by Newsroom for RNZ. You can get us downloaded free to your mobile device every weekday from any podcast platform. Today's episode was engineered by Mark Chesterman and produced by Sarah Robson and Bonnie Harrison. And thanks to John Epp and Richard Shaw. Matewa. Matewa.